Greetings all. I am going to go into complete opinion piece mode for this one. A couple of months back, Maximus over on his channel gave his opinion on the whole officer versus enlisted thing. Uh, of course, he's on the enlisted side of the house and covered things from his perspective. Fairly well, I think. I put a link in the description below. I thought I'd chip in with my thoughts from the commission side, partially because I think you might have missed a few things, and not least because I'm also often enough asked about it, much like he is. There are right reasons and there are wrong reasons to become an officer, and there is often a misunderstanding of the nature of the officer enlisted split. Now, I'm going to speak here primarily, of course, from the US Army perspective, uh, but it will apply to one extent or another to most Western militaries. One of my most mixed feelings times of year is when I get that annual email saying that the next OCS symposium is coming along and I must nominate a set amount of troops to go to it. Now, here's the problem. You want to send your best and brightest to go be officers. But it's the non-commissioned officers who are the backbone of the army, so you want good, bright people to be the sergeant's first class, top kicks, and sergeant's major of the future. Even education, a prerequisite to a commission in the US, isn't necessarily a distinguisher in the long term. A whole bunch of senior enlisted have degrees or postgraduate degrees. They very well may be better educated than the officer they report to. And of course, being part of the landed gentry isn't really a thing anymore. Indeed, most of the attributes for a good NCO are also the attributes of a good officer. Except one big one I'll mention in a bit. No, I'll get the obvious bit out of the way first, standard of living. I recall my first weekend away with the army, standing in the beating sun, getting square bashed, unpleasantly, by a couple of corporals in Kilkenny barracks. At the end of the weekend, one calls me over, Trooper Moran! Yes, Corporal! That door over there, second floor, right side, is a cleaning cupboard. You'll find what you need in there, clean that floor. Yes, Corporal. And off I go. As I'm mopping away, I conclude that I am cleaning the officers' quarters. I notice then two things. Firstly, they have beds, only one or two to a room, whilst I was spending my nights in a 30-man platoon bay with bunk beds. Secondly, I was cleaning the room, not the officers. Hmm. I will say that was, perhaps unfortunately, one of the things in my mind when I chose the commissioned route in the US. Rank half its privileges, after all. Except I went and I joined the most egalitarian damn army in the world. In Afghanistan, when I was at the French base, uh, dinner was served on the regimental China, flown in with them from Nîmes, their base in France, served by privates and corporals. In Bovington, you needed a jacket and tie to, just to have dinner. Uh, which nobody warned me about in advance, I should say. It's a different story. And uh, the wait staff were there with their, you know, kind of black clothes and white aprons, and they'd serve food on Royal Armoured Corps placemats. Last month, I went to a chow hall in Fort Bliss. I had my food thrown into a tray, and then I walked myself and my tray over to a table where I sat down on a cheap metal chair with flimsy cutlery and a plastic water cup next to a couple of privates over there. If I asked one of my privates to serve me dinner, I suspect that there will be added ingredients added somewhere in between the chef's station and my table. Now, I'm told that the Navy and Air Force is still a little bit different, but uh, don't join the US Army as an officer because you expect a cushy life. That said, even in armies which do still give rank those benefits, that had better not be why you want to become an officer. The difference is far, far more serious and comes down to your nature and a quality that you basically either you have or you don't have. Now, there are, of course, the various legal differences. So I was enlisted in the US Army, and then I was discharged from the US Army, and then appointed by the president to discharge the duties of leading and commanding said army. It's why enlisted folk get their uniforms and meals paid for, and us officers have to pay for it. However, nobody really cares about the legal distinctions in practice. Private Smith is going to damn well listen to an enlisted sergeant just as much as he will a non-enlisted captain. And I suspect the sergeant will probably be a bit more forceful about it. The practical differences, though, are more arguably a matter of interpretation, not law or regulation. Or at least I can't seem to find a regulation specifically stating what the heck an officer does. There are plenty of descriptions of the qualities of good leadership or command, 
but no simple description of the job. However, the Army's website states, that commissioned officers are the managers, problem solvers, key influencers, and planners who lead enlisted soldiers in all situations. Okay, I can't argue that. But you also can't say that non-commissioned officers aren't problem solvers, key influencers, or even planners, so there has to be something else to it. The way I consider it, and this opinion is worth what you pay for it, an officer figures out what needs to be done, an NCO figures out how to get it done, and the junior enlisted actually do it. Now, of course, there will always be exceptions to the rule, but I find it's a pretty reasonable generalization. OCS, Officer Candidate School, is far tougher than BASIC. I can't speak to the service academies or ROTC, but in basic training, the only thing you need to do to graduate is to follow instructions. In simple terms, shut up and do what you're told. And you'll be amazed how many people can't do that. In OCS, that won't cut it. It's got the same general environment of lots of yelling, mass punishments, exhaustion, and so on. But if all you do is follow orders, you're not going to make it. You need to stick your neck out, draw fire, make decisions. Remember, unlike Private Jones, as a new officer, you will immediately be placed in charge. When something goes wrong in your platoon, it'll be you getting the interview without coffee, not somebody above you. Jones was just doing what he was told. And this is far more intimidating in real life than it is just academically thinking about it, even as you're watching this video. When you're going through OCS or the basic branch school, they don't expect you to be the next Joe Collins. They don't expect you to get the right answer every time. At least as long as you just avoid picking a really stupid answer. If nothing else, I was told, just move to the sound of the guns. What they do expect you to do, though, is make a decision. The will to do that, I don't think, can be taught. If you make a decision and it's wrong, well, okay, we can have a chat about that afterwards and we can train you. If you can't make the decision at all, well, the reason I ended up with a tank platoon in Iraq was that my predecessor, who managed to get all the way through the education systems, couldn't make decisions quickly in the field. I had a CO tell me when I was a second lieutenant that he didn't expect a 2LT to know what right looked like. That was for 1LTs. A 2LT, however, a demo better know what wrong looks like. And I don't think he was far wrong. At the most basic level, I'd say that's the big difference between whether you want to be an NCO or an officer. How much responsibility do you want to take on at the equivalent point in your career? Now, before a Master Sergeant or Sergeant Major jumps down my throat and points out that an enlisted version of a change of command is the change of responsibility, and how dare I suggest that NCOs don't take responsibility for things, I would ask that you please look at the nuances here. A company commander in the US is a captain, aged in his mid-twenties. Consider how much responsibility an equivalently aged, typical enlisted person will have. And you just carry that comparison up the ranks. There is also a difference in the exact nature of the responsibility. So, you're a new butter bar just delivered to your platoon who now look to you for leadership, guidance, and standards. And of course, you know in practice less than the E5 who's your gunner. You've been school trained, but have zero experience. And this is why they will tell you to listen to your surgeons. Now, you are not there just to rubber stamp their recommendations, but generally speaking, they will know better than you do on many things. And then it hits you. Your platoon doesn't need you, it doesn't need a lieutenant. You just get in the way. Your best purpose is to deflect fire from the CEO and to do all that annoying paperwork. And to a point, this is true. Plenty of platoons perform perfectly well without an officer and the platoon sergeant does the job. He might be a little bit overworked, but he can do it. Why then are you even there? And the answer is that it's for your own education and progression. This is where you can get comfortable with making decisions, giving orders to real troops, learning the truth of what happens on the ground, what can and cannot be done, learning how a company operates, watching the commander, all while under the watchful eye of the platoon sergeant. By the time you've left the platoon, you should already be well capable of leading it reasonably well. You should be. I mean, when I left my platoon, my platoon sergeant said, at least I wasn't the worst PL that he'd ever had. Fair. I mean, I did screw up enough times. 
Your real purpose as an officer kicks in at the higher levels, where you start to make decisions beyond the scope of sergeants. They are the subject matter experts, the trainers, the people who know how to get things done. The officers are doing the planning of the major muscle movements, coordination, deciding who's going to go where, where, when, and most importantly, why. And this brings me to the next question. There are those who believe that having experience as prior enlisted makes you a better officer than somebody who commissioned straight from the outside world. And this is often supported by the anecdotes of enlisted folks comparing academy graduates, ROTC graduates, and OTS graduates. I have run into people who have told me that they have specifically gone enlisted so that they could learn things which would be useful before commissioning. I actually disagree with this and do not recommend ever doing such a thing for that reason. Uh, this actually places me in conflict somewhat with Maximus's personal opinion, but okay. Now, it very well may make you a better company grade officer. The troops may think you are a better company grade officer. After all, generally speaking, that's the only officer they interact with. You probably have a better handle on what's happening, uh, how things affect the troops, how to react with the troops. I don't see, however, that it will make you a better officer overall. Remember, the point of the officer is to make decisions. You don't get any experience doing that as a new private, and you certainly won't get any experience in a line platoon, which will make you a better operations officer or battalion XO, which is where you'll probably end up as a major in the US. And that's assuming you even stay in a line unit, which I did not. On the other hand, enlisted time is also time taken away from the other end of your commissioned career. I commissioned at age 27, many years behind most lieutenants. I'll be almost 46 when I pin on Lieutenant Colonel. Hopefully next month. I'm in the slot at least. If you take this to the other end of the regulations, you'll see that it's a virtual impossibility for me to make general before I hit the mandatory age of retirement. Not that I was really likely to make it anyway, but it's always nice to think it's possible. If you are happy to be limited as to how far you can go by your age and not by your ambition or capability, then okay, fine, go enlisted to try it out with the intent of commissioning later. It's not what the army really wants or needs though. So if you're not sure that you want to be an officer, but know you want to join the army, okay, go ahead, go enlisted first. If you are sure you want to be an officer, intend on doing so, don't waste time in the enlisted ranks. There is a reason that the two, officer enlisted, are considered so separate. The overlap of knowledge is limited, and I think you're only hurting yourself in the long term. Now, what I haven't talked about are things like temperament, leadership qualities, or the like. And I don't believe there are any different leadership qualities or temperament qualities from enlisted to commissioned. People can be commanded by the rank, but they are led by the person, and I would like to think that a platoon sergeant is as good a leader as a lieutenant, and vice versa, even if their responsibilities are different. So I said at the beginning that you want to keep your best and brightest to be NCOs, as well as to send them for commissions. Why? When they're called the backbone of the army, it's fairly accurate. It may be the brain that decide what the body is going to do, but the backbone holds everything together as it does it. Now, this is where I'm going to defer a little bit more to Matt, because of course I was never an NCO. However, my impression is as follows. First and foremost, the NCO is close to the troops. As a major, I work with PowerPoint and email. I show up, shoot my annual range qualification, maybe shoot some breeze, possibly even the targets, and then vanish back to my hideaway and coffee machine. NCOs are always with the men. The NCO is their primary trainer the person most likely to know what they need, either on the military or the personal side. You need to be a people person. You don't have to act like one. Dads can love their kids and still be quite strict after all, and the kids probably aren't too happy about it. But if you don't like working with people close and constantly, I can't imagine you'd be a good NCO. You also need to be the subject matter expert. Somebody has to, diplomatically, teach the new lieutenant why his tactical plan is idiocy after all. You'll have to know exactly how to make something work, be it how to input data into the Army's processing systems, how to get the tank unstuck, what bolts go where when you build a ribbon bridge. There are, to my knowledge, no commissioned students at the Master Gunner School. Which does bring up the question of going to warrant officer school as a specialist, but that's something else again. A signal officer will say, Sergeant, build a radio antenna over there. 
but he doesn't need to know how to actually do it, nor how to connect the radio or where to put the fuel into the generator, and neither does he need to teach the new privates how to do it. Remember my statement that officers figure out what needs to be done, officers, uh, NCOs figure out how to do it. It's also possible that NCOs simply have more fun. Remember, once you've been an officer for a few years, they take your tank or your IFV or your helicopter or whatever away from you and you start driving a desk. You can go from the most junior private to senior platoon sergeant and spend every waking day slotted on a tank or for crawling through mud. You want to shoot machine guns, anti-tank missiles, or push the big button to blow a bridge? Not something officers tend to do. Indeed, I've known a few folks who make it to Major or Lieutenant Colonel decided they simply weren't enjoying it anymore and resigned their commissions to go back as staff sergeants or warrant officers so that they could spend more time on the tank or flying their helicopter. So, my take on the whole should I commission question, assuming you meet all the regulatory requirements, comes down, I think, to two questions. One, are you willing to stand up front make the big decisions and take responsibility for them and the effects that they will have on many people who have sworn to follow your orders as well as probably people you don't even know. I mean sure there are other factors like being the example not being too friendly with the troops and so on but that's really the big one. If the answer to that is no well, forget any other ideas in your mind as to how great it may be to be an officer with a fancy uniform having ladies throw themselves at your higher pay scale or just the prestige of saying I'm an officer. Your one and only irreplaceable function, what they spend so much money training you to do, is to make decisions. If you can't do that, forget it. Two, are you the sort of person who would prefer to be with the troops? Train them, learn the intricacies of your specific art, and importantly, are happy to leave the big decision making to the officers appointed over you? Well, if yes, then that's probably the uh, NCO side. If your answer is no to both, one may question whether or not the army is for you in the first place. Of course, you can always just do a short stint and get out. But anyway, that's my two cents on the matter. If you have any opinions of your own as to how to describe the various functions of commissioned versus enlisted or how to choose which way to go if you have a choice, go ahead, put them in the comments, and I will likely go over them in the next Q&A. As ever, if you wouldn't mind hitting at least the like button, even if you don't subscribe, I'm told it does good things for my channel in the YouTube algorithms. Hope you found it all interesting and informative, and I will see you on the next one. Take care.